I believe that everybody has a story, and I'm fascinated to hear them. So come with me as we take a walk down Fascination Street. Hey guys, if you like what I'm doing, click the Amazon banner at the top of the homepage on FascinationStreetPod.com and do all of your shopping through Amazon. Once you click on it and it takes you to Amazon, you can bookmark it or add it to your favorites and you won't have to go to my site each time. It helps me keep the show going and again, thanks for listening. Welcome back folks. This episode is with Gary Batten. Gary Batten is the chief of the Choctaw Nation. That's right, you heard me. This episode is with the current and 47th chief of the Choctaw Nation, Gary Batten. Special thanks go out to Shelly Dennis and to Chief Batten's wife, Angie, for helping make this happen. Thank you so much, ladies. I appreciate your time and your efforts. Thank you. In this episode, we cover a wide range of topics. We talk about how many members there are in the Choctaw Nation. We talk about where the boundaries are physically for the Choctaw Nation. We cover some of the benefits that the Choctaw Nation offers its members. And we talk a little bit about the history of the Choctaw Nation and the United States government and how it came to be that the Choctaw Nation is a sovereign entity. Above all, this is a very fascinating conversation with the leader of a nation. And you can tell in our conversation how much he cares and loves his people. So enjoy, folks. This is my conversation with the current and 47th chief of the Choctaw Nation, Chief Gary Batten. Welcome to Fascination Street Podcast, Chief Gary Batten. How are you doing today, Chief? I'm doing great, Steve. How are you? I am wonderful. A couple of weeks ago, I interviewed a young lady named Shelly Dennis. And on that episode, she mentioned a little bit about the small town she was from and the fact that she was part Choctaw, I guess, what do we say, Choctaw Native American? Do we just say Choctaw? Choctaw Nation tribal member. Okay, thank you. And while she was talking about that, she happened to mention that she knows the chief of the Choctaw Nation, which is you. Yeah, Shelly is a, a wonderful young lady, and, and uh, I don't know if she shared with you, but actually I uh, coached her, or I mean myself and my cousin actually coached her uh, when she was probably in the fifth and sixth grade beginning. Oh, in basketball? Yeah, actually, in softball, and that team actually ended up going to state their senior year in high school and winning the state championship. Get right on out of town. I had no idea. Yeah, she's uh, she was our first baseman, of course. If you know Shelly, she was tall, and uh, she could reach a mile and, and retrieve the, the ball on first base and help get people out. And uh, but anyway, it was it was a great experience, and, and Shelly, I've known her, so that means I've known her since she's about 11 years old. Wow, that's really cool. So let's talk about you. Where were you born and raised? Actually, I was born in Wichita, Kansas, and to kind of give you a little background, my mother is, is a full-blood Choctaw. Uh, my father uh, was from West Virginia. He was in the military station at Fort Sill in Oklahoma here. That's where my mother and he met. And, uh, of course, he uh, was an uh, inspector on planes, on aircrafts. And not long thereafter, after he got out of the military, then that's when they moved to Wichita, Kansas, because of Boeing and Cessna and so on. And that's where I was born. But I was literally there for just a, a year or so. Uh, but actually, my mother which is, again, is the full blood. She had my grandmother's original allotment of land, which is uh, years ago that um, as tribal members, they received 160 acres each. So my grandmother was on what's called the Dawes Road Commission, which was from 1896 to 1906 as they went around and asked people, are you Native American? And so are you Choctaw and so on? And each person got 160 acres. So that's where I literally grew up. And on this 160 acres, there was my, my grandmother had passed away, but my grandfather was there. My cousin lived in a house next to us. Then there was our house, aunts, uncles. 
uh, always jokingly said when the school bus stopped by because everybody went to our driveway uh, for people to get on, there was about 20 to 25 of us that got on that bus from all of the relatives. So majority of my time, uh, I grew up there in uh, Clayton, Oklahoma, which is where Shelley's from as well. Now, you said that um, I guess your grandmother was, was given 160 acres? It, and actually, my grandmother and grandfather both were given 160 acres each. Oh, each. Wow. So who was it given by? It's given by the federal government. So, Stephen, you just tell me if I get too in-depth in some of these things. But uh, being the chief and uh, being a tribal member all my life, it's very near and dear to me. But it, whenever we came across the Trail of Tears, we signed what's called the Treaty of Dance and Rabbit Creek in 1830. In exchange for, of course, that's where we were located in modern-day Mississippi at the time. And so we were given what's called Indian Territory back then for all this land, which is now modern-day Oklahoma. So when we came over here, we accept Christianity uh, very well. We accept education uh, very well. We, matter of fact, we had our own civilization when we was back there. I mean, we have our legislative, executive, and judicial body even back into the 1830s. And so that's the reason why the federal government, I know a lot of people are confused about tribes and tribes saying that they are a sovereign nation. The reason why we are a sovereign nation is because the sovereign nation of the United States of America signed an agreement with the sovereign nation of Choctaw Nation and gave up that land. Well, we got this land here. And so at that time, it was per se, if you will, a reservation. And so Later on, I always say you got to be careful what you ask for. Our tribal members said they wanted their own individual land. And so, and I can't remember the, the date, but Senator Dawes with U.S. Congress at the time said, well, we will name all of these, we'll identify all these tribal members and give them 160 acres out of this reservation, if you will, out, out of this land that was a, that was given to the tribe. And so basically when that happened, that done away with all of our reservation status. So each tribal member got 160 acres. Now, what nobody mentioned is also in that legislation, they passed that once you drop below a blood quantum of one half, then you have to start paying taxes. Well, none of our tribal members knew anything about taxation. And so a lot of our people lost that original lot of land. Matter of fact, I lost my mother this last year, but we still have our portion, which my grandfather and them had given my mother five acres of that original allotment of land. And we still have that five acres and we still have what I call our home place on it. And I will never sell that. Uh, I guess you should say never say never, but uh, it would be something very extremely critical because it's so important to me I mean, that's what our people sacrificed for, to come across the Trail of Tears so that we could have these opportunities that we do today, land being one of those, and I'm not going to give that up very easily. And so so basically, I know that's a long story to let you know that's, that Clayton's where I, I grew up. That's where we, uh, my grandmother's original allotment of land was, and that's where the my mother's home still is today. So you said your mother is 100%? Well, I say that she's a seven eighth Choctaw and one eighth Chickasaw, which back years ago you could only claim one or the other. So she's seven eighth Choctaw, which makes me actually fifteen thirty seconds, which I'm a thirty second below half Choctaw. Gotcha. Now, is there any chance that we could do some DNA digging on your dad and find out you got an eighth over there or a sixteenth or something? Uh, maybe so, but I think it's probably going to be highly unlikely. I think most of his family was from England, from what uh, <laughs> research that we, we know on, on that side of the family. But I always say it's interesting, though, uh, Steve, a lot of people get wrapped up on blood quantums for Native Americans. But I don't hear anybody really going, you know, well, how much Irish are you? How much German are you? Nobody ever, because there's no requirement of blood quantum in uh, any other race. And I think it's a way to make sure that we, even our tribal members, it's kind of sad because I always harp about you need to be proud of your heritage, even if you're a small amount, because that's your heritage. No different if, if you came from Ireland, you, you couldn't say, well, you're only one eighth 
Irish now, and so you need to forget all of that history and, and culture that you left behind. And so to me, it's real important that you know who you are and that you are proud of your culture and history. I 100% agree. I was just trying to figure out how we could get you that whole 160 back. <laughs> I, I would love that, but I don't think that's going to happen. And, you know, it's always blood quantums is always an issue. I had a person that was here yesterday that they could go back and they could show where their great, great, great grandfather and mother was down in Mississippi at the time. They had original allotments of land, all these things, but they didn't sign up on the Dawes Road Commission. And so there's no proof that he's Choctaw at all. And so it's just kind of sad that through all these documentation, of course, you have to sh show your relationship from birth certificate to death certificates, you know, so on. Well, a lot of those, that information was kept in courthouses in the late 1800s, 1900s. Some of those burnt down. So now there's no proof that your mother is your mother because there's no birth certificate or death certificate. So it's just a huge, complicated uh, process, the only thing that we have to rely upon at this point in time is the Dawes Road Commission, which I don't know how much faith I really give into it, but it's the only thing that we have. Interesting. My wife, a few years ago, we were trying to get passports so that we could take a trip out of the country, and we needed the original something or other. I don't even remember, but it was a lot of paperwork. And uh, we ran into an issue, much like you were saying, because the hospital that she was born in burnt down, and so all the records were gone. And so that was a, a giant pain in the caboose. So I can certainly understand where you're coming from with some of the stuff that you have to deal with like that. And it's just kind of sad for a lot of people that more than likely are tribal members, but they have no way of proving that just because of um, no documentation. Also, the, there's the story, I would say a story, of um, uh, the chief at the time that he kept three of the, the original Dolls Road book. Now, whether that's true or not, which means all of those people and their family, those books are lost. And so is it true, not true? Anyway, it's just difficult. It's confusing. It's hard for people to understand. It's hard for people to get around uh, their head around, if you will, because, for example, if you're a U.S. citizen, you're a U.S. citizen. That's it. You know, you were born here, so on. Uh, the tribes have to prove that they were related to somebody that was here prior to to get their citizenship. To get their citizenship in the Choctaw Nation? That's correct. Yes. Gotcha. Gotcha. And please forgive my ignorance. If I ask any question that is in any way offensive, please let me know that it's not my intent. I understand completely. So why would it be necessary for someone to prove? I mean, I know that you say you said that, you know, they would need to prove it to sort of gain the Choctaw citizenship. But to what end? Like what is there a benefit to that or is it pride? What What is it? Well, of course, as chief of the Choctaw Nation, I mean, I want people to become tribal members because that's their culture. That's their history. That's who they are. That's the blood that runs through their veins. However, yes, there are benefits. I guess it's kind of like if you're a U.S. citizen, is there a benefit to being a U.S. citizen? And, and, uh, and what I mean by that is because we are a government, we do offer certain types of services to our tribal members. A lot of that it depends upon where you're located. You have to realize from 1830 to 1983, the president of the United States appointed our chief. It wasn't until the Indian Self-Determination Education and Assistance Act of 1976 that we were able to come back, ratify our constitution, truly have our election where our people chose our chief was 1983. So if you can look at it from us regaining our country, we are a fairly young country. And so at that time in 1983, we were 100% dependent upon the federal government, meaning when we signed the Treaty of Dance and Rabbit Creek, they said that, you know, they would provide health, education, housing, those types of things, general welfare. And since that time, you know, we have really excelled since we've been able to become our own country again, our own nation. 
uh, because uh, we started some of our own businesses. We actually started our own what we call travel plazas, our C stores. But then in uh, 2002, we were able to get gaming passed in Oklahoma. We'd done a compact with the state of Oklahoma. And that really pushed us forward from an economic development perspective. For example, now we're about probably 80% on of our revenue goes to provide services to our tribal members. We only use about 20% of that comes from the federal government. So we have totally almost flip-flopped of being dependent on the federal government to make in our own way. Of course, now we're into manufacturing. Now we're in diversification. We have 77 different businesses uh, located throughout, not only in the Choctaw Nation, as we call it, the traditional boundaries, but also in other areas of of, uh, the United States. And so it's been a great journey. But through that, those dollars that we've been able to make, we've been able to provide health care to our tribal members that live within our 10 and a half county traditional boundaries. We offer educational assistance for higher education scholarships through what we call our career development that helps people to go to trade school. You know, they can go to electrical, plumbing, all those types of things. We have what's called an emergency assistance program where people have um, hurricanes. If they have burnouts, we help uh, provide some services in regards to that. And, of course, in 1987 is when I started with the Choctaw Nation. I was 20 years old. That time I was delivering supplies, typing out purchase orders. We had about 110 employees. Today, we have about 11,000 employees within the Choctaw Nation. And so we offer a lot of employment opportunities, uh, housing. We do offer uh, housing finance across to tribal members to all across the United States. Uh, we do offer some ho- different housing opportunities here within, again, the traditional Choctaw boundaries. And that's just to name a few of the services that are benefits to our tribal members. That sounds amazing. So you said that there is, uh, I think you said a 10 and a half county uh, designation that is the Choctaw Nation? That's correct. That's probably misleading when I say that. Uh, Let me start on the eastern side is Arkansas. On the southern side is Texas. On the northern side is the Canadian River. And then there's an old wagon trail that makes our border on the west side of the Choctaw Nation which encompasses really actually a little bit more than 10 and a half counties, but that's our geographic region. If you can get, get into that mindset, we're in the Southeastern part of Oklahoma. Oh, gotcha. So basically as soon as I cross from Texas into Oklahoma, I'm technically within the boundaries of the Choctaw nation. That's correct. From downtown Dallas to Durant, which is where I'm located here at our headquarters, you're talking maybe an hour and a half if, at most. Interesting. So. You mentioned a bunch of the benefits that the nation gives or provides for its members. Why is it so important to offer these things, particularly health care? Health care is a really big deal in the conversation in the rest of America right now. How long have has your nation been providing health care for your members and why is that part so important in particular? Well, first of all, again, like I said, we became a, a regained our constitution in 1983. We actually compacted, uh, which means if you can remember, again, the Treaty of Dance and Rabbit Creek, they were supposed to provide health care. We took that responsibility from the federal government. And we said, let us do it. So we got money from them before they used to provide it to us. We were in a hospital that was built in 1930. This is in the 80s. So it's 50 years old. It was a TB hospital. It's just horrible. And so when we took it over, then we were able to expand it and and grow it. And I'll get into that a little bit later, uh, just because I used to be over the the health system. But the reason why healthcare is critical, it's a basic foundation to our tribal members. Without your health, you, you can't hardly do anything. That's the reason why, again, going back to that Treaty of Dance and Rabbit Creek, housing, health, education, those are the foundational things of anybody being successful, or when I say successful, even just having a good quality life. And so that's the reason why healthcare to me is is mission critical, because again, you can be a millionaire, but if you're dying of cancer, that million dollars does not help you at all. 
And so it's, of course, for us, it's about our, our spirituality as well. I mean, meaning that you've got to be mentally, physically, spiritually all well connected. How can you do that if you've got a uh, pain that's that's bothering you and and agitating you? So it, it's a it's just a foundational need that is critical to the success of our people. I think those are very wise words that more than just you as a leader of a nation should be embracing. So good on you, Chief. Well, thank you very much. And by the way, Steve, if you don't mind me just telling a little bit about the the healthcare whenever again I became the executive director of health in nineteen ninety six. We had just changed chiefs. Chief Powell became in office at that time. I was uh, 30, or I'm sorry, somewhere around in that area. But anyway, he asked me to build a new hospital. So that was my number one initiative was to go out and get financing. It was looking at a $28 million project. The tribe didn't have $28 million at that particular time. And so uh, got financing and was able to build a, a state-of-the-art facility there, went on later to build six more clinics. My goal was to have health care within a 30-mile radius of uh, no matter where our tribal members live within the 10 and a half counties, built a new recovery center for people with alcohol and substance abuse. For males, we also built uh, what is called Chihola Lee, which is in Choctaw means we care. For our mothers that has children, they're able to bring their children there and to help them get off of drugs and to um, do that. We also built a, a diabetes wellness center uh, which, believe it or not, just received the Joint Commission accreditation of a gold seal, which is the only entity in the whole United States that's received that, whether it's Indian or non-Indian private sector. And so we're very proud of that. We built, I can't, I think we've got up 17 wellness centers now that we've constructed uh, since that time. So anyway, we're trying to get into prevention, intervention, and treatment of uh, health for our tribal members because we're no different than anybody else. Obesity really plagues us. Uh, diabetes is still a major issue for us. Cardiovascular disease and cancer. So we're really trying to trying to close that generational gap of those people that's on that were diabetics or cardiovascular smokers and so on. We're trying to change that in a culturally sensitive way so that we can make sure that our younger people embrace it and, and break that cycle. That is amazing. As a side note, my wife is a psychiatric nurse, a master's prepared psychiatric nurse, and has been for quite some time. And uh, part of what she does is work with the Joint Commission to uh, make sure that their facilities, whoever she's working for at the time, that their facilities stay within regulations and guidelines. So a little more than the average bear, I'm sort of familiar with the Joint Commission. And I have to say, I'd never even heard of a gold seal. Yes, and we just received that about uh, two or three weeks ago. So it's taken us a period of time because, like I said, I think um, the uh, uh, wellness center, Diabetes Wellness Center, we constructed that. Oh, it was before I became assistant chief, so it was probably around 2003. So, I mean, it's taken us a while to get there. But it, the reason why they gave us that was because of the comprehensive care. We have an endocrinologist, we have a podiatrist, as well as primary care providers and social workers to do case management, nurses, all those things to, again, to provide that comprehensive approach to reduction of, of diabetes. That's amazing. Is diabetes particularly a problem with the Choctaw Nation? Oh, very much so. Um, diabetes, I think, is generational for us. And, and now this is Gary Batten's uh, analogy just because of going from health to assistant chief to chief and used to be in housing and so on, is that our way of life has changed a lot. I mean, even in my time, I was born in 66. And so even as a kid, I can remember, you know, we used to go out, we would hunt our game and, and so on. We would harvest our game. And, and so there, there was tons of work to be done is my point. And, you know, from that point to the 70s and more so in the 80s, I mean, then then the McDonald's, all the fast foods, everything started coming in. Our bodies are not used to that, is my assumption. And I think that's what's causing our obesity, you know, but we're, we're no different than anybody else that we're struggling with trying to provide opportunities for our kids, going to ball games and going to plays and doing all these things and trying to 
cook a very good meal for our children and eat well and so on. So diabetes really, I can remember uh, again back in 1996, we used to have amputations every week of of uh, whether it's toes, legs, things like that. Uh, an amputation anymore is very seldom heard of, uh, which we're very proud of. Now we just got to be able to get people to where they can eat and exercise properly, more so on the nutritional side than it is the exercise. Our our people are very athletic. I mean, very agile. I, I can tell you of a person that is, is 5'9", probably weighs 260, and I mean, they can play basketball still. They can play softball like you would not believe. But then when they get into their 50s, then diabetes hits them, you know, or maybe they're in their 40s, hits them, and it just and most of our tribal members are so active, and then they become where they can't be active, and then it just spirals on them. And so it's it's really taking a toll on our people. Understood. Now, back to when the uh, the chief at the time asked you to, to build these facilities and sort of charged you with raising $28 million. Ha- I think you said you were somewhere around 30. How does a 30-year-old even go about raising $28 million? <laughs> well, first of all, I think that was the beginning of uh, what I could call uh, leadership on demand. <laughs> and what I mean by <laughs> that is you, you, very, you very quickly assess yourself of what you're good at and what you're not good at. And so for me, I knew that I didn't have all the answers. And so I relied upon a, a person that actually used to work for the federal government through Indian Health Service and asked them to help me. What's the process for constructing this? Also had another friend that knew finance. And so, you know, it's bringing those resources to you. And I still do that today. The things that I don't know or that I'm not good about. I mean, I'm not going to do those. I'm going to have somebody else that is 10 times better than me to do those. And so that's where you have to be willing to say, I don't know, or I, I'm not capable. And I learned that at a very young age. And and a matter of fact, Steve, I don't want to deviate too much, but just to give you a little bit of, of history, when I was younger, I was talking to you about my mom and dad. Well, I had an um, uh, older sister. The sister was the oldest. I had a brother after uh, there's Brenda, there was Fred, and then there was Joe, and then there was me. I was the youngest one. And I mean, we grew up going to church. Everything would just, uh, you know, work together, play together, just was the all American family, I would say. And then um, we ended up, because we couldn't make it here in Oklahoma, so we moved back to Wichita, Kansas, and got up there. Anyway, my mom and dad ended up divorcing. Well, my brother and sister were out of school by that time, which left me and my uh, Joe, my, my brother that was next to me. My dad brought us back to Oklahoma, me and, and Joe and him. My mother stayed in Wichita, Kansas. My dad was working for the police department, he actually ended up having a car wreck that paralyzed him from the chest down. He was in the hospital a lot. My mom was still struggling with the divorce. And then my, my brother, Joe, and I was kind of living by ourselves. He was 18. I was 14. He actually ended up committing suicide. And so then I lived by myself for about six months. And uh, thank God for family. You know, I had cousins and things that lived close to me that helped me uh, eat and things like that. But I, at that time, I didn't have um, I didn't have any heat. I didn't have uh, so uh, we were on a well, so I had water, but it was cold water, but I could shower and things like that. And the reason why I just tell you that story is it's not a sad story. The reason why I said what, what uh, doesn't kill you make you stronger. And for me, learning, I, so I had to learn at 14 really how to, you know, resources become critical. Your Your thought process, you know, how you assess things become mission critical uh, just to survive. And and uh, I don't mean that in a, uh, you know, you, you learn very quickly where you're at. You know, uh, I never was the type that I was going to manipulate. I wasn't going, when I say manipulate, I wasn't going to beg, borrow, or steal or anything like that to, to make it in life. But you do learn that, you know, at that time I had to swallow my pride. I, I didn't want to go to my cousin's house and they told me to come over and eat. And so I'd I, I reluctantly went ahead and went over there because I, you know, I wanted to to survive and so on. But but anyway, that's the reason why I have, I guess, the passion so much for our people 
because even though the tribe is doing better, some of our people still struggle. You know, I think a lot of people think wealth changes everything. Uh, wealth does not uh, change. Matter of fact, if you got a, a person that uh, has problems with drugs and you give them a million dollars, well, they're going to have a major cocaine or whatever drug problem. And so my point being is I just relate to them extremely well. My heart goes out to them. And until they're able to become aware of what's keeping them from succeeding, do they even realize the life that they, they're living? At that time at 16, I mean, I was just trying to survive. I never thought, well, hey, this is giving me great skills for one of these days and I could become chief. I mean, I never even dreamed that I would ever be chief. And so anyway, I just I just tell you that just to kind of give you a little background about why my passion and why my heart is, is so much into this role. Well, thank you for that. I think that shares a little bit of insight maybe into how you uh, maybe govern I don't want to say govern your people, but sort of how you help run your nation. Very much so. When did you decide that you wanted to get into Choctaw politics? I mean, you could have just as easily sold your five acres and, you know, moved to L.A. to be an actor or whatever. Like, you could have done anything. What made you stay there and decide to work your way up the government? Well, first of all, like I told you my, my story, so I knew there was a lot of people that, that needed help. Uh and whenever um, I started with the tribe, I was working in the purchasing department and delivering supplies. So it wasn't, I mean, I was, I was always about relationships. Uh, mine is about helping people. You know, I, I, here in the Choctaw Nation, we say we, we live out the Choctaw spirit of faith, family, and culture. Got to know God, got saved when I was a senior in high school. And so I always had this and what I went through. So I always had this compelling conviction of wanting to help people and the only way you do that is through building relationships, building trust and and so on. And so I don't know that I ever really imagined that I would ever get into politics. Mine was never I guess I always see politics as a negative word. That means you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. But I've always believed that you build great relationships and from great relationships and friendships then there's a lot of good that comes out of that. And growing up in the Choctaw Nation, as I continue to, to grow and build relationships and so on, then even when I was over the health system, I don't know that I ever pictured being the chief of the Choctaw Nation. It was just to help our people as my goal. And then Chief Powell asked me to become the assistant chief. And then, matter of fact, it kind of thrust me because I thought, uh-oh, I'm, I'm in the politics now. And But, you know, I still, and even today as chief, I still keep my philosophy of, of building relationships, doing the right thing. And, you know, if I get elected, so be it. If I don't get elected, I'll go do something else. And you got to be willing to accept that. So that I know it's a long story, but, you know, I would have never dreamed I would ever be into a political arena, if you will. Well, I think that is also kind of speaks to your general character because I feel like the people who specifically drive, like they have a goal to be, you know, in charge of whatever, thousands, 10,000, millions of people. I think there might be something a little bit, I don't want to say wrong, but maybe something a little bit off that, you know, makes them think they need to be the one telling millions of people what to do. So I think it's really cool when you sort of accidentally back into it or when it just sort of happens and it wasn't your goal. Oh, definitely. It was never my goal. I mean, at, at all. And, and like I said, and, and of course for me, it's kind of historical, you know, me, not meaning historical, me becoming the chief, but historical because years ago, our people chose the chief that nobody actually ran for office. Just our people said, this is the leader for our nation, this is who's going to lead, and that's just how it happened. And I feel like that's kind of the way this has happened for me. Uh, it was just, it kept seeming like I, I kept being pushed that way, meaning from, I, I talked to people today, and they said 20 years ago they knew I was going to be chief. And I was like, well, I wish you would have told me because I didn't know that. <laughs> and uh, so I hope that means that they, they saw something good in me. I would imagine. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now, you did mention the word history, so I just want to let everybody know, and also to ask you if it's true. I think I read somewhere that the Choctaw Nation, those soldiers were the first original Native American code talkers in World War One. Is that the truth? Oh, very much so. The story is that uh, they overheard some of our Choctaw men uh, talking, and they didn't know what language it was, and so they they approached them and they said, basically, what language are you speaking? And they said, well, Choctaw. And they said, could you use it? And so they actually used it in World War I to help uh, send messages, which was they were being the messages were being intercepted and they didn't understand. They didn't know it was Choctaw. It was very much a matter of fact, our co-talkers, when they came back home, was told to keep it a secret. And so a lot of our co-talkers never even told their family that they used their language to send messages. And so they were never given an awards or, or um, you know, highlighted. And my understanding is that that's still on the books as a potential, I'm trying to think of what that's called, but basically where they could still use the language. However, now, if anybody else knew that, they, could, they would probably come and try to find out from another Choctaw, how do you speak your language and try to break that, that barrier. But, but no, we were the original code talkers of World War I. That is amazing. What a contribution. Well, and I don't know if you know this or not, Steve, but Native Americans as a whole, not just Choctaws, but Native Americans, we volunteer at a higher rate than any other race in the military. And I believe it's due to um, our, I, in Choctaw Nation, we say the word Tushka, which is warrior. And uh, we've always been a warrior, but a warrior doesn't fight for wrong reasons. A warrior fights, you know, for family, for home. And we've known what that's been like for a long period of time. So yes, we are Choctaw. Yes, we are Oklahomans here in Oklahoma, but we are very much American citizens and we're going to help defend our country. Well, thank you for your service. I appreciate that. Chief Batten, how many registered members are there in Choctaw Nation currently? We have almost 200,000 tribal members. Wow. That's a lot of people. And you're the you're the chief of all these people. What does that feel like? Uh, well, it's, it's humbling that people would be willing to support me to help uh, lead and, and guide the nation in the right direction. But it's a lot of burden, and what I mean by burden is I take it very seriously. You can probably tell by the tone of my voice. I mean, accountability, responsibility, honor, integrity, all those things mean a lot to me. It's just simple words. It's transparency. I mean, that I represent them, and so it's it's rewarding. At the same time, it's scary because sometimes that uh, I don't know all the answers as the leader, I I don't know what's going to break sometimes that cycle of even though the tribe's doing well, like I said, we still have a lot of people in poverty and still alcohol and social media. What is that key? What is that mechanism that's going to help them succeed and grow and help their family? So that's probably um, the best I can wrap it up in a nutshell. (laughs) Are there, I mean, I'm sure, well, I mean, I'm guessing, other tribes of Native Americans, are there currently chiefs? Are they as organized as the Choctaw? Oh, very much so. You know, in the eastern side of Oklahoma, we have what's called the five civilized tribes. And there's us, Chickasaws, Cherokees, Seminoles, and Creek. And I would say that, and I don't want this to sound boastful, but we are probably the most progressive tribes across the United States. And the reason why we were called the five civilized tribes, again, is because we embraced Christianity. We embraced education. Always said that we were very adaptable. We're not fit into mainstream society. We've remained true to who we are as our people. But yet our environment has changed drastically from 1830 to what it is today. Technology, all those, we embrace those and we try to improve upon those things. And I think that's what has helped us succeed. Do the five chiefs get together and have, you know, meetings and things? Oh, very much so. Every quarter, uh, matter of fact, in July, the uh, five tribes will come together and we discuss all types of concerns from whether it's uh, social programs to economic development initiatives to just 
sometimes we we have lunch and we even talk about our wellness you know just how do we balance the the burden of and the opportunity of, of serving our tribal members while yet trying to remain healthy and mentally and physically and spiritually strong at the same time. Is there a, I know you said you were elected, is there a term or is it a, 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 like, are you there until you retire or die? No, there's a election. Our constitution uh, is every four years. Uh, Chief Powell, uh, former chief before I came on, he retired in, in 2014. So I fulfill as the sixth chief, I fulfilled his unexpired term in 2015. I ran for chief. I got very fortunate, got 87% of the votes. And then uh, just recently, this year was supposed to be an election. In May, we had the filing dates and knock on wood, God bless me and, and nobody filed. So I'll have another four years. So, and we do not have any term limits. So I could run for as long as I wanted to, but I can tell you as a leader, I don't think that's probably going to happen for me because I do think there's a point in time where it's not about the tribe as a whole and it starts becoming about are you still as passionate as you were before still willing to work those long hours and do those things and uh, I've already got my staff telling me when they start seeing those indicators they need to tell me and it's time for for me to move on but yeah every four years and then also we have 12 in our legislative body so we have 12 council members and six run every two years and the reason why our constitution is set up that way is so that we don't have a, a total upheaval in our government. At least it's stable. At worst case scenario, there's more than likely still going to be six stable council members, even if there's a new chief and six other council people. Gotcha. Now, when you said that, uh, knock on wood, nobody filed, does that mean that there was nobody who was going to run against you and thus you win by, by not running because you don't have to? That That's correct. I filed, nobody else filed to run for chief, and so I was able to retain the position of chief. If you would have forgotten to file, what would happen? Would there just be no chief? <laughs> that's probably what would have happened. There would just been, they would have had to see if anybody would have stepped up and, and ran for chief at a, another time. That's funny. I wasn't going to let that happen, though. Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> Again, forgive me for asking if this is, you know, inappropriate or offensive, but is there a Choctaw Nation casino? Oh, yes. We have, uh, I think we have 17 casinos now. Oh, okay, great. So is that part of where the funding comes from to offer all of these services? Oh, very much so, Steve. That If we didn't have gaming, I don't know what we would do. Right now, we're at 93% of our revenue comes from gaming, that's the reason why uh, diversification is a, a critical thing for me. We're into manufacturing. We expanded. We have um, uh, 19, I believe it is, convenience stores. We just recently started two grocery stores in the last two years. We also provide medical services along with other, I would call them social programs, as well as social work and so on to our military. We're in 10 different countries right now providing those opportunities for our men and women in, in uniform. And so uh, we're very proud of that. We started our, a ranch. We own a 45,000 acre ranch. We own about 80,000 acres total. We branched out, started our own pecan factory, so on. Of course, we've um, started into franchising. So we have five, I think it is, franchises currently uh, now that we partner with people. So we're we're just at the point where I'd say we're uh, really starting to expand and starting to grow and trying to put, we've been able to put our footprint in southeastern Oklahoma, and now we're trying to put our footprint on the rest of the world. Wow. That sounds like a giant boulder to push up a hill. Are you ready for it? Oh, very much so. I, I've got the right people in the right place to help me. Like I said before, I'm I'm not the smartest one. I just know what direction that we need. I mean, it's always a balance because I don't know if you've ever thought of this, Steve, but we do not tax our people. We're the only government that I know of that does not tax its people. So the way we provide services is only through generation of revenue. And so I know I jokingly, uh, when I went up and met President Trump, I said, you know, I'd be a great model for the United States to follow. But I don't think he accepted it as a sense of humor at the time. So, but anyway, that's how we have to continue the success for our tribal members and our success is really dependent upon how well we generate our revenue. 
What was the occasion where you went to go meet with uh, President Trump? He was looking at deregulation in regards to opportunities on Native American land. And here we go into politics, which is, again, what I don't like and I don't feel comfortable with. But I'll I'll give you my personal opinion is that I, I said, you know, the tribe should have the right to choose how we govern our land how we choose what we, because for us, we have to balance protection of our culture and history along with whether we do something economic and how do we make that balance and work and so on. He was basically wanting us to just open the floodgates and allow people to come in. And this, again, this is just an example of maybe start drilling, maybe start doing things like that. And I was not in favor of that. Uh, Also in this meeting was some of the other chiefs across the nation but also there was governors of states. And I think it's just a history lesson. For example, there was the the governor of Maine. He was saying that he wanted to, to, he was needing natural gas to Maine. Well, they, uh, I can't remember whichever state that was bordering them would not allow them to to get uh, that. He's like, oh, well, we'll just go up through Canada. We'll come back down through there. and, And this is the way we'll approach it. And I said, well, you know, well, can the tribes have that same autonomy and do that? Well, we couldn't allow you to do that. And the reason why I say it's a history lesson, because I still think he sees states as greater than the tribes. He does not see us as a nation like Canada, like Mexico. They signed the treaties with us. You don't sign treaties with the state. You might sign compacts and contracts with a state, but not with a but not with a nation, though. Interesting. That is a history lesson. Thank you for that. You're welcome. And, and uh, just to let you know, I've been very fortunate. Actually, President Obama, the, the first week I was elected, which it was not because of that, Steve, but he actually came to Durant because we had, it's called Connect Homes, which is where we're trying to get Wi-Fi and, and uh, things like that to our rural areas in, here in southeastern Oklahoma. And uh, he came down, he visited with us here, and I was also very fortunate that uh, when President Bush uh, was in office, I was able to to meet him as, as well. Uh, he had passed a housing bill that allowed us to expand housing in Native American country. And so I've been very blessed to, to meet the last three presidents and to um, uh, understand their leadership style and, and to, uh, again, just see how how well they work with the tribes and trying to build that relationship again with the federal government. Very cool. This might be a bizarre question. Is there a Choctaw Nation seat on the United Nations Council? No, there's not. But that's something that we've definitely considered and and are advocating for. Well, then good question, Steve. (laughs) It's an awesome question. (laughs) (laughs) Well, uh, Chief Batten, I know that you have a lot of stuff to do since, you know, you have so many people to take care of, clearly. Before I let you go, is there anything that we didn't talk about or I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about? Well, I mean, I think it just wanted to make sure that everybody that, that listens to this podcast understands, Steve, that I, I think they have this ideology of what a Native American is. You know, they, they see the headdresses, they see... For example, the Choctaws, we never wore headdresses. We we don't do the fancy dancing. We do social dances. And my point is, is that I would hope that people would love to learn about each individual tribe and how they have impacted the United States to not put us in that box. I mean, I would love to welcome anybody here to Grand Oklahoma to show what the tribe is all about, our history, our culture, where we're at in regards to today and um, the successes that we had, the failures that we've had, but because I want them to look at us and also to see us as a government, but also see us as that organization that generates revenue to supply. So my point being is I don't know that if something happens at Google that they automatically say Facebook is horrible. You know, it, and so but one thing can happen bad in Indian country and all tribes are bad. And so I think uh, I would really encourage everybody to do their homework, to read about the tribes and to understand who we are really as people and what we're about. Where do you suggest that people go 
where they can learn those things? Well, it's, you can go to ourchoctawstore.com to, if you'd like to buy books and, and things. We have a Choctaw artistry at choctawnation.com where you can learn more about those types of things. What's interesting, Steve, is that it's hard to find a lot of material about Native Americans. There's a book by Angie DeBow. It's about our Choctaw Nation, but it's more of a legal representation of where we came from to where we are today. Not a whole lot of social books in regards to just, you know, the lifestyles and, and those types of things out there. So it is difficult to find. That's something that we're trying to work on in the future is developing our own history book so that, you know, most history is told by uh, somebody else. We want to tell it from our side of the story. You know, it's always says that the victors tell their, their own history. That's the way we want to be able to tell our own history. That is awesome. And lastly, uh, Chief Batten, is there any place where people can find you on social media? Oh, very much so. They can go to uh, ChoctawNation.com and they can link up with me via email, Facebook. I'm on there. I'm on Twitter. And so they can reach out and find me in any of those social medias. Fantastic. Oh, Chief Gary Batten, thank you so much for taking the time out of your hectic and crazy busy day to let us get to know you a little bit better on Fascination Street. It was an honor and a pleasure to speak with you, and I hope that we can, you know, stay in touch, and maybe the next time I'm in, I'm in the area, I could drop by and actually shake your hand. Oh, Steve, just thank you so very much for allowing and, and your interest in uh, Native Americans and in, in the Choctaw Nation, and so to just allow us to tell my personal story and to tell the Choctaw story. I think it's it's worth hearing and I just appreciate you so much and it's it's an honor to get to know you as well and would love to host you if you ever come to Durant or sometimes we have a we actually have a meetings in San Antonio with our tribal members and so maybe we can connect at some point in time but and but more importantly definitely stay in touch. I would absolutely love that. And I will do. I will definitely keep in touch. We have each other's info, and um, I say let's let's keep this relationship going. You said you're all about relationships. We're going to find out. <laughs> exactly. Put, put me to the test, Steve. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Chief Batten. You have a great rest of your day. Well, it's Steve, if you don't mind, I, I would like to just leave with a, a couple of Choctaw words, and one is Yako Ki which is thank you very much. And in, in Choctaw, we never say the word goodbye. There's no such word. Instead, we say Chapisa la Chiqui, which means until we see each other again. So look forward to seeing you. I love that because particularly with the spiritual people, that's true. I'll see you again. It might not be here, but I'll see you again somewhere. So I think that's awesome. I love that there's no goodbye. I love that. Well, again, it is great talking to you, Stephen. Just appreciate your time very much. Yes, sir. Until we see each other again. Okay. Chapisa la All right. Thanks. Thank you. As always, thanks for listening, Streetwalkers. And don't forget, follow the show on Twitter at FascinationSTPD, on Instagram at Fascination Street Pod. Follow the podcast page on Facebook at Fascination Street Podcast. And of course, you can always email me at fascinationstreetpod at gmail.com. And if you haven't already, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button and rate us on iTunes. For the next three months, everybody who rates and reviews the show and sends a screenshot to fascinationstreetpod at gmail.com will get a free surprise gift mailed to them. Every single one of you. So do it. Thanks, Streetwalkers. Opening music is the song Magnolia from the 2014 album Intransigence. Used with permission from Douglas Miles Clark. Closing music is Apollo from the 2001 album Into the Known by the band Sapphire. Thanks for hanging out with us and getting to know a little bit about our guest. We'll see you next time on Fascination Street.